Hi, and welcome back to Two Think Minimum, the Technology Policy Institute's podcast. It's Monday, June 28th, 2021. I'm your host, Scott Walston, President and Senior Fellow at TPI. I'm joined by my co-host, TPI Senior Fellow, Sarah O. Oh. And today we're delighted to have with us Roger Knoll. Roger is Professor Emeritus of Economics at Stanford University, a Senior Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economics Policy Research. Prior to coming to Stanford, he has been a senior economist at the President's Council of Economic Advisors, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, Institute Professor of Social Science and Chair of the Division of Humanities and Social Science at the California Institute of Technology. He's been a member of the advisory boards of the Department of Energy, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA, the National Renewable Energy Lab, and the National Science Foundation. He holds a PhD in economics from Harvard University, a BS in mathematics from Caltech, the author or co-author of 15 books and over 300 articles on many subjects of particular interest for today's discussion. For much of his career, he's been involved in antitrust and the economics of sports separately and their intersection. And then about 25 years ago, he went and forever stained his record by being my PhD advisor and inflicting me on the policy and economics world. Roger, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure, Scott. Good to see you and Sarah. Yeah, thanks. So the big news is the Supreme Court's ruling almost entirely against the NCAA last week. So to start off, tell us what the economics issues are, the situation prior to the ruling, and how the NCAA ever managed to create such a goldmine for itself by exploiting players. Not that I have a prior opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, the this has been a very slow train wreck. The NCAA was formed in the early 20th century as a mechanism to make football and basketball less dangerous. That uh, in the last year before it was formed, 18 college football players died. And not as many died playing basketball, but a lot got smashed in faces because the rules were so lax. So the NCAA, when it came into existence, pronounced that sports should be amateur, by which they meant not only that the players wouldn't be played, but that the coaches wouldn't be paid. They wanted to have everything be clubs. And that's because, of course, the entities that made these initial rules were schools like Harvard and Princeton and Yale, where sort of upper middle class to rich people wanted to make the rules clubby. They wanted to sort of look like the kind of social clubs that they grew up with. Are these sort of like, are these like, you know, what have become intramurals at schools? Well, no, because they were intercollegiate. So they were still intercollegiate. Okay. Yeah. And this was a reaction to the fact that college sports, well, not only football and basketball, but also baseball, had become professionalized in the late 19th century. In fact, one of the best deals at Yale was one recruit every year as part of the recruiting package was given the rights to sell concessions at Yale football games. So it was a, a highly professionalized activity and the, all the revenue taken in from games after costs were paid were then divided among the players. And so it was a, a straightforwardly professional activity. For 50 years, the NCAA tried to put an end to paying players but it never enforced any of its rules. So as a result, the college football powers of the 20s and 30s were de facto semi-pro teams. And it wasn't until the 1950s that the NCAA finally decided, they finally got the votes from the membership to make it an enforceable rule to put a cap on how much an athletic scholarship could be. Initially, they tried to ban athletic scholarships, but schools ignored the rule. So in the late 50s, they began to define what an athletic scholarship was. And then over a period of about 15 years, they got the rules got tighter and tighter and tighter. In the mid-60s, they, for example, for the first time, banned appearance money, what we now call names, images, and likenesses, or NILs. That was perfectly legal, Clark, until the mid-1960s. All right. So that is the background. And then the timing was exquisite. About the time they had finally nailed the coffin on all the benefits for athletes, television came along and the revenues just exploded. So you had an explosion of revenues against capped costs. And that's when football coaches and basketball coaches and athletic directors started to make tons of money. And then we fast forward into the 2000s where many football and basketball coaches are paid more than the sum of the value of the scholarships of all the athletes in the school, right? And so this huge disparity, as you can well imagine from a little application of EC1, if it's the coaches 
who are the ones who are succeeding or failing in recruiting athletes who are value of five or six times as valuable as the amount you have to pay them. Competition among schools for coaches who can do that causes the value of the athletes to be transferred to the coaches. So now we have $10 million coaches, $3 million assistant coaches in a world where they, it used to be the case coaches were paid roughly what an assistant professor would be paid, and now they're paid four or five times as much as the university president is paid. That's where we got where we are, is the, this attempt to control costs before the explosion in revenues and then the explosion of revenues, which is what caused all the pressure on the system and led to all this litigation. So before we, I mean, before we talk about the litigation and, and the outcomes, is it the case then that we may be going back to the way college sports were? before the NCAA, or at least during the early days of the NCAA? It's possible, but I don't think that's the most likely path. Okay. But I think that the right way to characterize it is we are now entering a world of great uncertainty about what the future will hold. Because if it were the case that an unrestricted market for college football and basketball players came about and star quarterbacks and star point guards started getting paid one or two or three million dollars a year to play for Siwash State, that could break the whole system apart. It would cause, you know, lots of universities to say, is this really what we want to do? Is it, do we really want to be in the entertainment business? And if we do, why aren't we making movies and television programs? And all that? <laughs> you know, so I don't think that colleges will evolve permanently in that direction, but I don't know. I think we are entering an era of uncertainty. The NCAA will try to preserve itself because the case didn't actually kill it off like it could have. And there are going to be other attempts to bring new rules to bear on how to control payments to athletes. And we'll see if they produce a system that A, colleges are happy with, and B, the courts agree does not violate the law. Okay, so how did this case start? And how did it end up at the Supreme Court? Okay. The case is one of a series of core of cases that have been filed over the past 20 years. There really are three important cases. The first was Jason White v. NCAA. That was an attempt to eliminate the NCAA's role in capping athletic scholarships. That was settled prior to going to trial by the NCAA increasing the benefits available to students. The attorneys in that case actually did a mock trial and lost in front of their hand-selected jury. And so they thought that there, that there was a good chance that they couldn't get a jury to vote to kill off the NCAA rules. So they settled for a reasonably large amount of additional money going to students, but it still retained the basic structure of the NCAA rules. Then the next set of cases were those that had to do with names, images, and likenesses, where the O'Bannon case is the poster child. And that one was not a direct hit on the NCAA rules about scholarships. It was an attack on the rules prohibiting appearance money and endorsement income and prohibiting students from earning advertising money from their podcasts. <laughs> and Those pennies just roll right in. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, again, O'Bannon sort of won, but the relief in that case wasn't really directly related to the complaint. The complaint was we should be allowed to make endorsement income and other kinds of income by exploiting our names, images, and likenesses. But the relief was, and therefore will increase the value of your scholarship, but you still can't do that. So it was sort of a non sequitur. And almost, you know, I was surprised, frankly, when the Supreme Court did not take the appeal to the Ninth Circuit's O'Bannon decision, which, you know, imposed this new set of rules on the NCAA that weren't directly related to the complaint. So that was a bit of a weird thing. And then the next set of cases was the one that ended up as Alston. But again, there were about 20 of these that were consolidated together in the same court that heard the O'Bannon case. And these cases were actually a direct frontal assault on the scholarship limit, the compensation limit. And the decision by the lower court is really interesting to read. It's the kind of thing I would assign in an undergraduate course in antitrust and regulation because it goes on for 100 pages. And I would say 98 of those 100 pages are just absolutely negative about the NCA. They sort of read just like the Supreme Court opinion in this case. But there was one little hook, which is 
that the judge bought the argument, despite saying there was no evidence to support it other than testimony by NCAA officials, that they believed it. There was evidence that the demand for college sports would be less if players earned a salary that was related to performance. All right. And so the she came in through the back door with her injunction, which is the NCAA can continue to do whatever it wants to do, regulating compensation to athletes related to their athletic performance, but it can't regulate compensation for academic performance. It can't control education-related benefits, with one exception. It can cap cash awards for academic performance, but at no less than the amount that it caps athletic performance. That what that has subsequently been decided to say that you can do something like if you stay eligible this year, Mr. Athlete, you get a cash award of $6,000. Now, why is it the case that reducing demand for college sports would be an argument to uphold what the NCAA does? Why is that an economic argument at all? Uh, that's, that is actually the single most important question. And interestingly enough, that issue was not appealed, but it should have been. <laughs> okay, the, the basic issue is as follows. There's an anti-competitive act that not only did the judge find the NCAA rules were anti-competitive and harmed athletes, the NCAA didn't even appeal that. So we start the appeals court and the Supreme Court hearing with the NCAA not appealing the fact that they uh, they impose anti-competitive harm on athletes. The NCAA's defense is, ah, there's a pro-competitive benefit to consumers because they like college sports more if we exploit the athletes, all right? Imagine, if you will, well, we don't think you should get rid of slavery because our customers like to be served by slaves, right? And it's just a complete strange argument. And antitrust jurisprudence generally holds that benefits in another market cannot be used to offset harm in the market where the conduct occurred. There was actually a colloquy in the oral argument before the Supreme Court where they asked the solicitor general who was appearing for the United, as an amicus for the United States. They didn't ask the attorneys for the other, the two sides that were there. They said, shall we go after this? You know, as uh, was Amy Coney Barrett was the one who asked the question. She said, but the benefits are accruing to consumers and they're not in the same market as the athletes. Why should we even consider this? And the solicitor general said, well, nobody briefed it, so I suggest you just ignore it. Hmm. All right. So the whole case hinges on one market benefits offsetting harms in another market. And that is contrary to antitrust jurisprudence. And it should have been a valid basis for appeal. But the plaintiffs chose not to appeal it because they wanted to have zero chance <laughs> of losing the benefits that they had already acquired, which are considerable. I, you know, I think that the Supreme Court decision is probably worth 10 grand a piece to every college basketball and football player. And over the long run, it may be worth 50 grand a piece. How do you expect that that's going to be distributed? Oh, most of it. I think it's going to be just an across the board improvement because the nature of the injunction doesn't change the system that everybody gets paid the same. All right. The only way you can have heterogeneity of payments to students now is through something called a student assistance fund. There's a $100 million kitty that is created by the NCAA from its various sources of income and distributed among the schools where you schools can give individual grants to athletes to deal with special circumstances. And the most famous example in the trial of this was Miles Bridges, who was an All-American basketball player at Michigan State. In order to induce him not to be a one and done, to stay in school a second year, mm -hmm. Michigan State bought him a loss of value insurance policy that costs Michigan State over $50,000. So basically, Miles Bridges was paid $50,000 above his scholarship to play one more year. All right. So then others, like, for example, one school paid for a new suit for a player to attend the Heisman Trophy Awards and other similar things like individual benefits that are worth in the thousands of dollars were given to specific athletes for specific reasons. And so this is all prior to the prior to the rule. 
yes, this was all evidence in the Alston case about how they already people are already getting paid above the scholarship limit on an individual basis. Therefore, it couldn't possibly harm if, if more students were allowed to earn things in this way. And if there weren't a big budget cap, you know, $100 million sounds like a lot of money, but when you divide it by 350 Division I schools, it's not a lot of money. So that means a handful of athletes were getting this stuff per year and they were the stars, right? So that, but nonetheless, that's good evidence against the consumer's care. Because if Miles Bridges got an extra 50 grand and Michigan State still sold out all its games and its fans still loved them, that's good evidence that the demand effect is not there. Mm -hmm. I had a question too about the size of the market and how the money is being spread around. So in the opinion, it said, you know, TV rights for March Madness are over a billion dollars a year. Yes. Some other TV rights, I guess, for football are like $500 million a year. So if consumer demand for March Madness continues to grow and players get paid, I mean, if it grows faster than what players are getting paid, do the benefits accrue to the coaches and the stadiums? And yeah, the- that's exactly right. That's exactly you're a good economist. <laughs> no, that's exactly what's happened between 2000 and 2020. Mike Shashevsky's salary as the coach of the Duke basketball team went from 300,000 to 8 million. All right, the percentage rate of growth in coaching salaries in general not only the head coach, but the assistant coaches and the trainers have grown faster than revenues, all right? And indeed, one of the pro-competitive benefits that the NCAA offered in the case where they lost on summary judgment was that the revenues from the revenue sports have a pro-competitive benefit. They subsidize A, other sports, and B, other academic activities. But in fact, the reason they lost this on summary judgment is the data don't show that at all, that most schools lose money on their football and basketball programs, all right? Because the competition among them just transfers. Instead of paying the players, you pay more to the coaches and the trainers and all that. And in addition to that, you build more elaborate facilities because that's a recruiting tool. In a real business, you'd build a facility based upon its ability to generate revenue directly. Like, you know, you have a team of given quality and the bigger the stadium, the more tickets you sell and you keep expanding the stadium or the arena up to the point where the incremental revenue from an incremental seat justifies its cost. Well, not in college sports because one way you recruit these star athletes is, isn't this a fancy facility? All right. And you get to play and live in this wonderful facility. One of the there's a wonderful video of the University of Alabama's football training facility, which has a room in it that's that's called the game room. And it it's all around it are these huge television sets where they have sports events going on. They have a foosball game in the middle of the room made out of Brazilian teak. <laughs> and uh, this the five minute video is a training is a recruiting video to show how great life is for an Alabama football or basketball player by showing the facilities, showing the arena and the stadium that the players play in, showing the dorms where the athletes live. And so this becomes a domain of competition and hence you overspend on them. You know, if, if you said to an Alabama football player, would you rather have a Brazilian teak foosball game or an extra $5,000 in your scholarship? Guess which one he would pick. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you said that there's a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen, what the markets will look like now. But how do you imagine that the rents would be, what proportion are they coming from? I mean, there's value in Duke, the Duke name. There's value in Krzyzewski, there was. And then, then there's value in some of the stars. And it's been prevented from really going to any of the stars so far uh, until now. You know, if there were such a thing as a competitive market here, wh- well, where, where are the there, there from? are actually, interestingly enough, there have been quite a few academic articles published, academic research been published on this very question. What is the marginal revenue product and hence the best estimate of the competitive wage of a college athlete? It's hard to do because of the fuzziness of the data, but the results come up. Basically, remember there are roster limits. 
All right, there's limits to the number of scholarships. And these limits are binding because they only were imposed in the 1970s and 80s. Before these rules came into effect, many schools had more than 100 football scholarships a year and as many as 17 or 18 basketball scholarships. Now it is a binding constraint at 85 for football and 13 for men's basketball, 15 for women's basketball. So because it's a binding constraint, it's perfectly plausible that literally everybody is exploited. It wouldn't be that way if there were no such constraint because you just keep recruiting athletes until a large revenue product equals the scholarship value. So the literature attempts to address this question Probably the best article, there's a lot of good articles on it, but the one I think is best because it's based on the best data was by Janet Nets and her colleagues who at Applicon, which is an economics consulting firm that used to operate out of uh, University of Michigan. Now it's since they moved to Berkeley, it operates out of Berkeley. But Janet's estimate was basically that the worst player on a team is probably worth three or four times as much as a scholarship. And of course, the best players are worth a million or so or two million. And the the finding here is important because it does, from purposes of antitrust litigation, allow you to have class action, mm-hmm. right? Because everybody is exploited. It allows you not to have a case that isn't just Miles Bridges trying to get extra money. It's all of his teammates trying to get extra money as well. So the answer to your question in a very convoluted way is it's probably the case that when you're recruiting somebody ex ante, you don't know for sure how good they're going to be. So there's some probability that Scott Walston is actually going to be the next All-American running back. (laughs) It's always been low. (laughs) And so that probability times that value means you offer Scott $100,000 a year instead of the $40,000 a year that the average scholarship is currently worth. I mean, that's pretty significant because this is not just the stars. This is a, a real wage for the median player. Exactly. And, and then when you get you know, to back to Sarah's question about the billions of dollars, if this becomes like the pros, then 50% of the revenues goes to player salaries instead of the current 10% or so. Mm-hmm. All right. So, you know, you just imagine the March Madness story, right? If a single year of March Madness is really worth a billion dollars, what does that mean about the players on the final four? How much did they work? Right. It's a lot of money. I mean, I would also think that would make it, uh, you know, a more interesting to people who are watching it. I want to know who, you know, I, I would be invested in who wins that. Well, the thing that's interesting about it, it's all the, the compensation system for March Madness already has a feature to it that if you, you know, most people do not realize, but there was an article in one of the, I think it was, was one of the sports, I think it was Sports Illustrated about the first million dollar three throw. All right. And it was, a game that was played in an early round where there was an upset and with less than a second left on the game, a player at an underdog made two free throws that caused his team to win one point. And that was the first game in which getting to the next round was worth a million dollars to the team in question. All right. And that was like 10 years ago. All right. So now it's more like two million that every game you play in the tournament is an extra million dollars in cash benefits to your conference. Right, but not to the player. But not to the players. (laughs) But guess who would get half of that? (laughs) Right, yeah, exactly. (laughs) If there were a market for players. One thing that we haven't talked about explicitly in all of this is the role of antitrust and the NCAA's interaction with it and lack of accountability to it. So how does that play in? Well, the interesting feature, but the NCAA, I think we should cast the net somewhat more broadly. Okay. In general, there has been great judicial deference shown throughout most of history to sports governing bodies. All right. But there has been so much bad publicity about sports governing bodies in the past 30 years, that this deference is going away. It's not just the NCAA where People at the central office are paid salaries of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to go hammer on poor kids because they receive an extra $2 they shouldn't have received. All right. It's not just that. It's also the 
way that coaches treat players and the injuries and heart attacks, even Mm -hmm. the deaths by making them play when it's 100 degrees outside and them getting heat stroke. And then more broadly, the scandals involving gymnastics coaches for sexual abuse. You know, the Penn State scandal. The IOC. Um, the those FIFA, collection the FIFA, of crooks, crooks. Yeah, the FIFA corruption and where they locate the World Cup. There's been so much bad stuff about sports governing bodies that this deference has pretty much gone away. It used to be people were willing to say, these guys are sort of doing it in the public interest. And even though there's no statutory antitrust exemption, even though there's no law that really sets them up to have all this power that they have, we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt. That's pretty much gone. All right. And it's gone in part because of the scandals and in part because of the obvious disparities that have opened up, such as that between how much a coach is paid and how much a player is paid. So that has created an environment which go back to the story I told earlier in the Jason White case, the attorneys were afraid they'd lose. They would not be afraid they'd lose now. Right. And that's only a dozen years later. All right. And that's because the public's attitude and judges are part of the public, about sports governing bodies in general and the NCAA in in particular have become much more negative. And so it's much more credible for a lawyer in court or an economist testifying to attack these bodies as just cartel managers that exploit people. It's a much more credible argument now than it would have been 15, 20 years ago. So, I mean, what's what's the point of the NCAA now? You know, what role does it have to play? Why not just a scheduling app? Yeah. The interesting thing about all sports governing bodies is they start with a completely legitimate purpose, mm-hmm. which is that they're safety. basically standards organizations, mm-hmm. right? That's what they are. They're, they're the IEEE, right? They say, okay, here's how you play intercollegiate football. Here are the rules, all right? And here's how many games we're going to play. And here's how we're going to decide a national championship. All these things are beneficial. It's a good thing that there is some degree of standards being set. This is, you know, the anecdote that is compelling about this is the the very first college football game, which was the first college football game was actually supposed to be a series of three games between Princeton and Rutgers. And game number one was at Rutgers. Game number two was at Princeton. And game number three, if necessary, was going to be a site to be named later. The rule was the home team gets to make up the rules. So when the game was at Rutgers, they made up the rules as being basically soccer and (laughs) Rutgers won. When it was at Princeton, they made it up as basically rugby and Princeton won. The third game was never played because they couldn't agree on what the rules were. (laughs) (laughs) So that's always, that's a classic example of a public good that's being provided by a private organization, namely a standards organization. Where the NCAA got in trouble, and that's why how it got started, remember? People were getting killed playing. Wait, you said football. safety was uh, yeah. safety was the uh, start. Uh-huh. And but they tried to convert that into being a cartel, and that's because that's the incentive. Once the organization is up there and they can make mandatory rules, why don't we just get together and collude, and so we can get richer? And that's the slippery slope. And that, and in some organizations like FIFA and the Olympics, the purpose of the cartel becomes to enrich the people who run the organization. But in the case of the NCAA, just like in some professional sports leagues, the purpose became to enrich the people who run the teams at the expense of the players. So where, I mean, where does that lead the NCAA now? I mean, what is, again, still now, what is the purpose of the NCAA? I guess there's still a reason to have rules, you know, a a standards body, um, but beyond that? Well, and you know, the other thing, there's another issue about pro-competitive benefits, which was agreed to in every single one of these cases by the plaintiffs, which is it probably is true that consumer demand for college sports hinges on the players actually being students. All right. If you ask why would somebody pay 50 bucks to see a college football game instead of a pro football game, the fact that the college game has students in it is an attraction for alums and students at that college. So that probably is true. So having rules about what does it mean to say they have to be students? Again, we can go back to the great example of Fielding Yost, a great football player of the 19th century, who technically was a student at West Virginia, but he rented himself out on weekends. One week he played for Lafayette, one week he played for <laughs> Princeton. Uh, <laughs> and occasionally Mercenary. he played for West Virginia. <laughs> so, you know, there are reasons to believe 
that the NCAA has some rule in restricting access to college sports to people who are students. We can have it. I think there are going to be people who disagree with me on that. But the point is, that's at least an interesting debate, whether the NCAA has that role. Do they have a role, however, in limiting, in deciding who gets paid how much? The answer is no, they shouldn't have that rule. That should be conferences and schools. You know, so, I mean, you said we can have a disagreement about whether that's the reason or that's a reason whether people want to make sure that they're students and it's important to the alums and so on. But is that where the money comes from for this? I mean, are the billion dollar TV deals because there's so many alums who, you know, watch it on TV? I, there's survey data that say that is a crucial element of college sports. It doesn't mean it's the only element, but it, that it is a crucial element. It's not that it would be zero revenue, but it would be all that you need is for it to be a substantial fraction of the revenue. And it would be very hard to prove that it's de minimis. You, it's fairly easy to show that limiting college, athletic scholarships to cost of attendance is not significant in determining what the demand for college sports is. That's, a, that's fairly easy. But, is it possible that the value of sports that comes from people who are not affiliated with the university in one way or another is the difference in value between D1 and D3? I mean, well, D three. The only value is the people who go to the school and, well, they, but and those alums. But, but, yeah, you never see those on TV. That's interestingly enough. That used to be true of D three, but you're showing your age. <laughs> <laughs> in some of the minor sports, there really is commercial value in D three. Oh, All right, uh-huh. and uh, but I think your point is well taken. In that, what you're asking is a really deep question. Why? Do the U.S. and Canada, alone among all countries in the world, have this highly commercialized thing called college sports? <laughs> Why would even Harvard and Stanford and Yale and Princeton care about having football and basketball teams that are important nationally? Why would they have minor sports that have no interest? And the answer to that has to be in the student part, the competition for students. People attend even Stanford. They will pick Stanford over Harvard because of the athletic program. All right. So competition among these schools has led to athletic programs. And that value doesn't hinge on the interest of the people who have no affiliation. That is value that comes from the students and the alums and the faculty and the staff who are there from the university community. And that probably explains why we have this. Now, would all those people be willing to continue to have it in a world in which it became really the NFL? One of the proposals about how to reform college athletes is to have universities essentially license professional teams Mm -hmm. to use their name and play in their stadium. I think that would kill it off. I don't think that would work, but I could be wrong. And I don't know of any way to generate any evidence before the fact that would predict that accurately. But my instinct is that won't work. That this studentness, this relationship of athletics to campus life in American colleges is real. And the only reason it doesn't happen in Europe is because in the 19th century, community-based sports arose from neighborhood clubs as opposed to either high schools or colleges. And so there never was a vacuum to be filled by colleges for creating local community-based athletics because it would already existed through other kinds of organizations. Labor unions in Europe used to have athletic teams. And a lot of the English Premier League clubs have their origins in 19th century labor union teams. Hmm. So what do you think they... So I guess there could be two types of implications from this. One is, I mean, maybe this will have effects on other sports governing bodies. Like you said, I mean, it's it's sort of the general, the public's feelings towards these bodies have had a big effect. Um, And then the other is broadly in antitrust. Does this decision mean anything? It could have meant something, but I don't think it did. Okay, Okay. so let, let me deal with the first. It will be very hard because there have been so many bad news stories about sports governing bodies in the last 20 years, it's going to be very hard to say this was the straw that broke the back. But it seems to me that we are right in the middle of a reformation of how sports are governed. And sports governing bodies are not going to be able to continue to be 
defenders of abusive behavior and corrupt organizations where being on their board of directors is worth a million dollars a year. That era is probably over. And I don't think this case adds to the burden on them, but I don't think it's determinative. Off to the broader antitrust question, this case actually did raise three really significant antitrust jurisprudence issues. And on all three, the court did not make a decision. All right. The first one was the one we talked about before, which is cross-market benefits and costs of the anti-competitive conduct. The many amicus groups, including the Solicitor General, including the American Antitrust Institute, including an amicus brief from some antitrust lawyers and other amicus briefs from antitrust economists, raised the issue about the illegitimacy of cross-market comparisons. But in the end, because the parties didn't brief it, the Supreme Court did not address it. That has to be addressed sometime in fairly near future. And the reason for it is defendants in antitrust cases are going to reference this case as if it legitimized cross-market comparisons, even though it didn't. All right. And that's because they refused to throw out the NCIA's case on this ground. So right. is that the, the, what the, you know, that this uh, filing from Apple, is that a, an example of this? Yes, that's a good example. The Epic v. Apple one mm-hmm. is another one because the issue there about the pro-competitive benefit of throwing somebody off their site has to do with some other aspect of the site selling other Apple products. So yes, now I don't think this is going to work because I, I think the, the Supreme Court was, in Gorsuch's view, explicitly says, we don't have to go there to make a decision in this case, because even if we, whether we accept it or reject it, the end result is the same. That's what the case decision actually says. But there, then there are two others. The other, I think, important issue is this case was litigated under a completely crazy Ninth Circuit rule about rule of reason antitrust, which is that once anti-competitive conduct has been shown, then the defendant has a burden of showing there's a pro-competitive benefit. And then there's a third step, which is plaintiffs then have to present a less restrictive alternative that preserves the pro-competitive benefit while adding more competition. This is really bad because it says any pro-competitive benefit, however tiny, must be preserved even if attaining it causes an anti-competitive harm that's huge. There's no balancing. There's no benefit cost test. You can't take anything away no matter how small. Yeah, you can't take anything away no matter how small it is unless you can invent an institution that preserves it. And in this case, that's what causes this, you know, extraordinary cumbersome set of arguments about how can we give more stuff to the athletes without having any risk to even a tiny risk to the demand for college sports, because we've already gone through that argument about what a squirrely argument it is. (laughs) And we laugh about the squirrely argument that this benefit even exists, but the judge said, oh, I think there's some chance that it does exist. And she even said at one point, plaintiff's economists argue that if the conferences were in charge, they wouldn't consciously make rules that destroyed them. <laughs> and plaintiff's economists may be right, but I just can't risk it. <laughs> so that's how squirrely this decision is. So now we have this sort of squirrely, maybe ephemeral, certainly not terribly important benefit that must be preserved. And again, some of the amicus briefs raise this issue but it was not addressed in the decision. So right now, this Ninth Circuit test about coming up with a less restrictive alternative preserves all the pro-competitive benefits is still sitting there intact. And then the third one is the first few pages of Gorsuch's decision is essentially a pay-on to traditional rule of reason analysis. And it starts off with defining the product market, showing that the defendant has market power in that product market, This seems to say we can't do direct effects analysis. That is to say, direct effects analysis is where you skip defining what the market is and showing power. You just demonstrate that there was an anti-competitive effect on the people who were the objects of the conduct. All right. 
And direct effects analysis is used extensively in the Federal Trade Commission. And indeed, it's uh, used in the uh, reverse payment antitrust cases for drugs, you know, the, with the settlement of patent infringement cases in the drug industry. So Gorsuch goes through and says, here's what they did. And this isn't rule of reason wonderful. They defined the market. And neither the plaintiffs nor the defendant appealed anything about market definition or market power or anything. All of these ancillary steps, why he did that. At the time I first read it, I was saying, oh, my God, he's going to throw out direct effects analysis as a legitimate alternative. But he didn't. This section of the opinion just doesn't go anywhere. But it will be quoted (laughs) by defense attorneys as, ah, Supreme Court no longer accepts direct effects analysis. And what will be the real effect of that? I mean, will the court have to consider it? Eventually, the court's going to have to consider whether it really wants to reverse precedent about direct effects. There are Supreme Court decisions in the past, going back 30 or 40 years, that do bless direct effects analysis. And now there is fear among a, bu- you know, a bunch of plaintiffs-oriented antitrust attorneys. There's fear that this case is going to be used as an entering wedge by the current Supreme Court to eliminate, to reverse the precedent that honors direct effects analysis as a legitimate approach to a rule of reason case. We're really running out of time, and yes. you know, I, I hate to ask this this last question because it's a whole other topic, but we've talked about governance boards and the, lots of different types of governance boards or governance boards over different areas. And it seems like you know, sports governing boards had the tendency to become corrupt, have become corrupted over time. Almost all of them we can think of have been, except you know, maybe Little League, and even there I'm not so sure. that. I'm not so sure. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, IEEE hasn't, even though something like Wi-Fi is hugely valuable, right? That they could have, maybe. ICANN is maybe somewhere in between, right? It's accumulating this big monopoly of control. You know, what accounts for, I mean, it's an impossible question to answer in just a couple minutes, but what accounts for well, why some are so become the corrupted in particular areas and others don't? This is your friend Bill Lair's PhD thesis. <laughs> it's true. Right? I have to get him on there. Get him on there. Yeah. <laughs> no, and the answer is very simple. The, due to antitrust constraints, standards bodies have unanimity requirements. And they have open to everybody requirements. All right? So that means customers get to be part of the standard setting process. And they can veto something that's purely anti-competitive conduct. Of course, in the bad old days, when the telecommunications industry was Mm AT&T. AT&T would have loved to use the standard setting process to trump antitrust constraints on its behavior, but it had to deal with equipment suppliers and customers that who were independent, who were allowed a seat at the table. And they just would veto anything that was an attempt to use a standard to create an anti-competitive advantage. Now, having said that, they still have problems. And FRAND is a good example. Mm -hmm. the fair and reasonable royalty rates for standard essential patents. That's a good example of an area where, despite all the protections, there's, I would call it chaotic. The the law with respect to how you set royalties for standard essential patents is pretty much in chaos because it's a really difficult problem. How, you know, you don't want to have a system where all the people who will use a technology get to gang up and become a cartel to set the rate of a royalty for an innovation. On the other hand, many standard essential patents are one of 17 ways you can connect two devices. Mm -hmm. And they don't have any special advantage over another other than one's adopted and the others aren't. And giving them a lot of monopoly profits is probably a stupid idea. And so now we know we have a problem and it's as of yet, the law hasn't solved it. But so notwithstanding this example, in general, The legal requirements for standards organization in terms of openness and unanimity protect to a large measure against things like what the NCAA has done or what FIFA has done or the U.S. Olympic Committee has done or the U.S. Gymnastic Association has done. These entities are not subject, historically have not been subject to these same kinds of rules. And hence, there is really nothing out there other than very long time duration litigation processes and legal processes to fix them. But that's where we're going right now, because you're absolutely right. This power is corrupting and it has gone unchecked for several decades now, and it is only now finally beginning to be attacked. So that, I think, is a good place to leave it. Thank you, Roger, so much for being